in many ways more interesting uh, than Jehovah's Witnesses, unless, of course, you have loved ones or something like that in the Witnesses, then it's, it's not. But uh, there is certainly much more to be discussed when it comes to the subject of Mormonism, because as I said, with Jehovah's Witnesses, you have a narrow spectrum of doctrines, topics, and beliefs, but you need to know them in depth. With Mormonism, it's a wide spectrum, but not nearly to the same depth. And uh, so, generally, I, I like to give a warning before giving this presentation, and that is, because of the speed with which I have to do it, uh, the danger is I'm not presenting it in the slow way that Mormons would present it. And so the result is you listen to this and you go, how could anyone ever believe something like that? And as a result, you figure you can just go out and tackle the Mormon missionaries, which you might be able to do. I mean, they're 18 years old, for crying out loud. Um, you know, I've met a few that were somewhat knowledgeable, but most are not. Um, but these groups have their apologists. And it's one thing for us to understand, Jehovah's Witness apologists can be very, very challenging. And they can be very, very good at what they do. But the witnesses have their apologists as well. The danger of this presentation is you see it and you go, no one could ever really believe that. And yet many, many, many people do which is a clear illustration of the fact that intellectual capacity and spiritual understanding do not necessarily go hand in hand. You can be tremendously brilliant. Uh, I, I, know, I know Mormons who are engineers, Mormons who are authors, Mormons who are involved in, uh, there's a lot of Mormons in, in uh, the police force uh, around the world, in military. They, are, they tend to be really nice, moral folks. And yet they believe what I'm going to tell you they believe. I mean, I'm not making this up. I've witnessed over 5,000 LDS missionaries. We went to the General Conference, the Mormon Church, every six months for 18 years, stood outside and passed out tracts and witnessed to people for hours on end. I've done debates in Salt Lake City against staff members from BYU and the University of Utah. And, and I've got, I don't know how many thousands of volumes of LDS works in my library. And uh, Mormonism is what got me into apologetics. Uh, it was two more missionaries, elders Reed and Reese, who I'm sure do not to this day wish to be known as the two guys who got me into apologetics. But um, shortly after I was married, I was uh, <clears throat> 19, my wife was 18. My wife's an identical twin. Uh, two more missionaries showed up at my in-law's home. They saw this cute little 18-year-old blonde and uh, they're like, oh, let's uh, witness to her. And um, so she asked me to come over, and we met on a Monday and a, and a Thursday. I read a couple books on Mormonism in between time. And uh, that's what started it, is when we were finished with those conversations, I was convinced of two things. First of all, I clearly did not know enough about what they believed to be able to communicate with them in any meaningful fashion. I already sensed the massive language barrier that, that separated us. And secondly, I didn't know enough about what I believed, even though I was a preacher's kid, uh, even though I had been raised in a Christian family, and in comparison to all the other kids in the youth group, I knew more about what I believed than they did, but that wasn't, en <clears throat> that wasn't enough. Uh, I, I needed to know much more, and I needed to think through it uh, to a much, a much deeper level. Uh, so that was what started my studies. Uh, over the next number of, uh, of years, I studied Mormonism pretty much on my own. I, I uh, started going to the LDS bookstore because I read all the Christian books I could find on Mormonism. And I saw them regularly citing these other books, Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, Marvelous Work and a Wonder, uh, Jesus the Christ, Articles of Faith by James Talmadge, uh, uh, Joseph Fielding Smith's the Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, M Mormon Doctrine by Bruce Armour Conkey. And so I started going to the LDS bookstore and buying them, and, uh, which, which led me to my first Interesting experience is there was a nice little lady named Mary at the LDS bookstore at 35th Avenue in Northern in Phoenix. It's not there anymore, but uh, that's where it was at the time. And, and uh, uh, the first day I, I had to buy a fairly expensive book or a set of books, and I had to write a check. I didn't have the cash to do it. 
And so I wrote out the check, and, and I start getting out my, uh, my check card. And uh, she says, oh, I don't need that. What's your ward number? So there I'm standing, ward number. What do I do? Do I make one up? 654? <laughs> and end up you know, making a fool of myself? Or... So I was honest. I said, I'm, I'm not a Mormon. And uh, she says, oh, that's fine. I'll take the card then. But you keep reading these books, and you will be soon. You know, and she's just a you know, sweet little lady. And, and uh, so uh, I grew my library, and I read these books. And as, I, as I'm reading all this stuff, reading, uh, for example, here's, here's the LDS scriptures. This is called a triple. Uh, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl Great Price, the three uh, standard works outside of the King James Version of the Bible. They have four standard works. King James Version of the Bible, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl Great Price. Um, so I read the Book of Mormon. I read Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl Great Price. I'm marking all this stuff. I'm taking all these notes. And I just came to the point where I thought, there's, there's just no way that I'll ever remember all this stuff. How do I put all this stuff together? Thankfully, what I did is I started witnessing to Mormons a lot, uh, going out to the, the uh, Mesa Easter pageant in Mesa, Arizona and uh, going up to Salt Lake City. Dialoguing with Mormons is what solidified it all in my mind, basically. But for, I didn't have anyone to lead me. I didn't, didn't have anyone to say, okay, you know, let's put it into a nice, compact way of understanding it for you. And so what I'm gonna present to you today is uh, what I wish I had had. This would have saved me years, quite literally, if I had had this presentation, but uh, I had to do that so you could have this presentation, I guess. And so I'm going to give you uh, a graphic. And by the way, I just want you all to know uh, that uh, Thursday evening, I completely redid uh, this presentation's graphic just for you. Up at, I mean, even the folks in Hilo uh, last week when I did this same presentation, they had a graphic uh, that I had put together from a Word document when my daughter was in sixth grade and I performed her wedding ceremony last July. So it was a long time ago. Now you'll have a nice, clean, colorful, pretty one and you'll be the first ones to see it. So tap, pat, pat yourself on the back, uh, give yourself a, whatever congratulations is in Hawaiian. Uh, I'm sure it has an M, a W, a K, an L, and a vowel in it. <laughs> Wow. Um, <laughs> it, am I right? I bet you it does. Uh, and, and I can guess it does not have a V or a Z or end in ski uh, in it either. Um, <laughs> so anyways, let's dive into it. I like to, uh, when I started studying the Mormons, uh, I came to some conclusions without ever talking to anybody. They're just conclusions that I've lived my life on uh, my ministry it will be 30 years old next year. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a full 30 years now since I met with those two Mormon missionaries. And uh, so over three decades of this, of this work now, uh, I've, I've lived uh, by the, the credo, basically, that when you study a group, for example, Shane was trying to shame me uh, into uh, studying Buddhism a few minutes ago, uh, and I just looked at him and said, no. And um, if he tries to push me, there are certain videos I have on my uh, system that I will be playing on the screen in the next few minutes. So um, I, have, I have some things on, on Shane, so he needs to be careful. So besides that, I have the Dividing Line webcast, and I'm frequently on TV, so just be careful uh, what, what you do. Anyway. Um, if I'm going to study a group, I am going to study what they say about themselves. So I was going to the LDS bookstore buying LDS books. When I studied the Jehovah's Witnesses, I bought all the Jehovah's Witness books. Uh, when I started debating Roman Catholics, I obtained all the cans and decrees of the Council of Trent and Vatican II and all the rest of that stuff. And now that my heart is primarily in the study of Islam, my Islamic library grows and grows and grows. And unfortunately, that's very expensive. It's a lot cheaper to buy LDS books than it is Muslim books, I assure you. Um, but I, you know, I feel it's vitally important to know what a group says firsthand 
not just what Christians have said that group says, because I've discovered that sometimes, believe it or not, even Christians can be somewhat inaccurate, somewhat biased, maybe even a little bit prejudiced in what they have to say about certain groups. So our first series of quotations, uh, before I get to the graphic, comes from the Achieving a Celestial Marriage Student Manual, Copyright 1992 by Corporation of the President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, why do I give you all that information? First of all, 1992 wasn't that long ago, no matter how, uh, even if you're young, uh, you were probably still around uh, 20 years ago. Uh, it was used for over a decade as the primary manual that couples who were going to be married in the LDS Temple had to go through before they could be married in the LDS Temple. You had to go through and you had to uh, take this course. Secondly, it's from the church for the church. So this is the Mormons talking to the Mormons. This isn't Christians talking to Mormons. This is Mormons talking to Mormons. And so you can't get much more representational than what the church itself, the president, which is the prophet of the church, Jesus Christ, the saints, this is what they copyrighted. And you'll notice it's pages four through five. Uh, which means this wasn't buried in the back of the book someplace. This was the first thing that you were supposed to study as you and your future spouse went through this class in preparation for marriage in the temple. Pages four through five. God was once a man who by obedience advanced to his present state of perfection. Through obedience and celestial marriage, we may progress to the point where we become like God. So this is the first thing it says. God was once a man. And he progressed to his present state of perfection by obedience. And through obedience and celestial marriage, and God himself was married in a temple on another planet, on celestial marriage, we may progress to the point where we become like God. Proclaiming the divine potential within man, John Taylor once wrote, Knowest thou not that thou art a spark of deity, struck from the fire of his eternal blaze, and brought forth in the midst of everlasting burnings? Elder B.H. Roberts stated, man has descended from God. In fact, he is the same race as the gods, plural. His descent has not been from a lower form of life, but from the highest form of life. In other words, man is, in the most literal sense, a child of God. This is not only true of the spirit of man, but of his body also. Can you see the implications of these two statements as they relate to you and to your eternal destiny? Elder James E. Talmadge did. He declared, quote, In his moral condition, man is God in embryo. However, any individual, now a mortal being, may attain the rank and sanctity of Godship, end quote. Articles of Faith, page 529. Now, by the way, Articles of Faith is a book that I've read, and it is one of a series of books that is normally given as a gift to the young elders before they go on their mission. Now, my experience is they rarely read those books before they go on their mission, but they have them on their uh, shelf someplace uh, <clears throat> when they go on their mission. How is this possible? What course of action will bring this potential to fruition? As you study this lesson, look for the answers to these questions. Then you have points to ponder. Underline, God became God by obedience to law. God became God by obedience to law. Now, if God becomes God by obedience to something, what came first, God or law? Law did. The law existed before God became God. Now, if you're thinking as a monotheist, that doesn't make any sense to you, but you need to realize Mormonism is the most polytheistic religion that I know of of all the religions of men. I've had Mormons seriously defend the concept to me that there is an unlimited number of gods in the universe says. Unlimited. Infinite number. One of the reasons they did that is I pointed out to them, well, if there's an increasing number of gods today, because every worthy Mormon male feels he can become a god after he dies, if there's an increasing number of gods today, then there's a decreasing number as you go back in time. And if it keeps decreasing, you eventually get to the first God. And according to Mormonism, what was he before he was a God? He was a man. So who created the first man? To get away from that, they say, no, that's not, that's not logically accurate because there's an infinite number of gods. You can never get back to the first one. So it is a polytheistic religion. They prefer the phrase plurality of gods. 
Uh, and because what you believe about God and whether God is self-sufficient, whether God is the creator of all things, there's only one true God, or if there are many gods, because that's the most basic element of a religious system, then I suggest to you, as one who has studied in depth both religions, that Islam is considerably closer to Christianity than Mormonism is. Considerably closer. Muslims believe in one eternal God who created the heavens and the earth. The Muslims do not even believe God can create matter. He cannot say, let there be light. He can only organize pre-existing matter. And he himself was once a man who lived on another planet. In fact, the God of this world lives on a planet that circles a star named Kolob, K-O-L-O-B. Now, you tell me which is closer to Christianity. Uh, yes, the Mormons talk about Jesus, but he's one God amongst many gods, as we will see. Um, and so Mormonism, while they use our language, they use a different lexicon to define the meaning of those words. And even in this conversation we're about to read between a mature Mormon and a lesser mature Mormon, you will see how that language difference uh, manifests itself very clearly. So here is the conversation. It was late afternoon as we sat in my office, but I felt the time had been well spent. He sat silently now, obviously contemplating the ramifications of the things we had been discussing. We had talked of God, of how he had become God, and of what that meant in terms of our own exaltation. Finally, he spoke. What is this law of exaltation of which you keep speaking? Well, it involves the whole of the gospel law. Everything required of us by God is associated with this law, but the major crowning point of the law which man must obey is eternal marriage. Therein lies the keys of eternal life, or as the Doctrine and Covenants puts it, eternal lives. In other words, an in eternal increase of posterity. Let me just stop right there. There's your first example. The Doctrine and Covenants talks about eternal lives. That is, an eternal increase of posterity. In Mormonism, one of the attributes of being a god is that you can have children, spirit children. And if you are not exalted to the highest level of glory, your body is changed and you can't have spirit children. And so eternal life for us is one thing. Eternal lives is the ability to have lots of spirit babies after you die. Now that's a massive difference. That's a huge difference. And yet most of us would just have that go right past us because we're not familiar with what the background is then what you're saying is that God became God by obedience to the gospel program which culminates in eternal marriage. Subpoint: Through obedience to law, we can become like our Father in heaven. Yes, do you realize the implications of this doctrine as far as you are concerned? I think so. If God became God by obedience to all the gospel law with the crowning point being the celestial law of marriage, then that's the only way I can become a God. Right, and it is the law that assists us in reaching that potential. It tells us what we must do to gain the ultimate freedom. In fact, it is by obedience to law that we have progressed to our present position. Now, on the next screen, the second paragraph is one of the most amazing short paragraphs I've ever read in Mormon literature, and I've read a lot of Mormon literature. But notice I haven't put it up, because every time I start telling people this, they stop listening to me and read the paragraph. So this time, I just give you a warning and tell you what it's coming, uh, and then put it on the screen. You mean we have always been governed by law? Here it is. Always. You are an eternal being. You were never created, and you cannot be destroyed. But you can advance, progress, and develop by obedience. You see why I say Islam is much closer? to Christianity. Muslims believe that you are created by God and that God can destroy you. Mormons do not even believe you're created and you cannot be destroyed. You are an eternal being. You know, whenever I read that paragraph, I think of a certain creature in the Garden of Eden who said, and you shall be as gods. And we have this 
in Mormonism, where you don't have a God. God himself is an exalted man. You are a God in embryo. We're all the same class of beings, just at different levels of progression. It shares much more in common with the paganism of the old world than it does with Christianity. The next line also proves that this was written by a frustrated uh, English major from BYU. Then Hamlet's question, to be or not to be, is not the question? Oh, that is so corny. That is just, oh, I laugh every time I read it. Right, not in the ultimate sense, at least. Order means law, and that law is the law of the celestial kingdom. Any who come under that kingdom must obey that law. Anything you see that says C, D, and C, D, and C means doctrine and covenants. That's the, uh, that's the primary doctrinal element of the LDS scriptures, the uh, Book of Mormon, doctrine and covenants, and pearl of great price. But I thought Godhood meant freedom. If I have to do things to become God, am I really free? You have got it wrong. It was the Savior who said, if you continue in my word, that is, obey the law. How do you like that for exegesis? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So by obedience to law, we learn truths by which we become free, but not free from the law. Can you see that? I think so. I can only be a God if I act like God. Exactly right. Can you imagine the state of the universe if imperfect gods were allowed to spawn their imperfections throughout space? If beings who did not have law under their subjection were free to create worlds? That sounds like science fiction to you. This is coming from the LDS marriage manual. I guess that would be pretty disastrous, but I'm not sure I see why celestial marriage becomes the crowning apex of this progression. Marriage doesn't seem directly related to the creation of the universes. Oh, but don't be limited by your mortal perspective. God himself has declared his own reasons for existing. Remember, he said, for this is my work and my glory. I see his purpose is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Now, before you turn to your Bible and start looking for Moses 139, um, that's not in there either. That's in the Pearl of Great Price. And here you have, in the Mormon scriptures, their own, in essence, self-admission that their God's primary purpose is wrapped up in man. How else could it be? He is an exalted man. How different from Christianity. Which involves giving birth to spirit children and setting them on the road to exaltation. And if that is to be done, you must have an exalted man and an exalted woman. Exactly. An exalted man and woman who have been joined together in an eternal marriage. If this man and woman were obedient to all gospel laws except celestial marriage, what would be the result? They still could not be gods. Now I understand. Celestial marriage is the crowning ordinance of the gospel. Right, I said with a smile. And with that comment, I think we can end the discussion. Now, people normally look at me and go, come on, really? Gods and spawning imperfections through space and creating worlds. I mean, we know you're a Trekkie, but really, uh, honestly, this is what the Mormons believe? Yes, this is what the Mormons believe. So let's give you, I think, the easiest way to understand what the Mormons believe. This is not an Amway chart. <laughs> Just in case you're worried. Uh, here is the new version. I should have kept the old version around just so you could see uh, how much nicer this is than uh, what we had before. But um, uh, this is the uh, universal translator. Uh, this is the means uh, that I have uh, provided you of, in essence, translating Mormonese into Christianese. And if you can get a hold of this, then you will understand the heart and soul of Mormonism. And you'll be able to at least understand why the Mormons are saying what they're saying, and at least on your part, make sure that the conversation that you have with them uh, is useful. It's somewhat of a circle. It starts in the upper left-hand corner and ends in the upper right-hand corner, but as in any circle, you sort of have to jump in someplace. And so we start in the upper left-hand corner, uh, and I'll blow that up here. We start with intelligences and matter. Intelligences and matter are the two eternal things in Mormonism. Now, what is an intelligence? Well, I've actually met some Mormons that didn't believe in intelligences, but most do. An intelligence is, in essence, the, 
the essence of what becomes a spirit child. Now, that doesn't make much sense to you either. You'll notice spirit children is the next part. It's the, the arrow goes down to spirit children. In Mormonism, any sentient being uh, has existed as an intelligence. It's a, it's a disembodied, not even spiritual, it's just the, the, the intellect element of the sentient being before it enters into a spirit child. Now, you need to understand in Mormonism, even spirits are made of matter. Joseph Smith taught that they are made of matter, but that it's such a refined matter that it's not visible to the physical eye. But it's still made of matter. And so the intelligence would sort of be almost the soul or essence of the spirit child. And from the LDS perspective, all of us have eternally existed in that way. We cannot be created. Remember, we just read that. You weren't created. You have eternally existed as an intelligence, just as, well, God eternally existed as an intelligence. Elohim of this world and the God that he worshipped and the God that he worshipped before that and the God before that on back into eternity. Intelligences cannot be created. Matter cannot be created. God cannot say... The Christian doctrine is creatio ex nihilo, created creation out of or into nothing. That God can say, let there be, and there is. Mormons say God can't do that. God can only organize pre-existing matter. He can change its shape. He can change it from physical to spiritual in the sense of being more refined, but it's still matter. So God is not in this box. God is not eternal. Uh, God has not eternally been God. If you are a Mormon today and you became a God, obviously you've not, not eternally been a God. And so when we talk about the eternal things, it's intelligences and matter. From this realm, and a means that we will only be able to understand at the end of the chart, we enter into the realm of spirit children. Spirit children are born of exalted, an exalted father and an exalted mother. That exalted father and mother have physical bodies of flesh and bone, no blood. I'll explain that later. Even though they're physical, they have spiritual offspring. As we will see, according to Mormonism, you and I all existed as spirit children before we came here to earth. We don't remember that, and Mormonism does not give us a dogmatic explanation of why that is, most Mormons would simply say the reason we don't remember the spiritual preexistence is because that memory has been taken away from us so that we can be tested uh, in this probationary period in a, in a proper way. If we remembered the preexistence, then we really wouldn't show our true character. But interestingly enough, you must realize Mormonism is a very much American-grown religion. And uh, especially back in the late 1800s, early 1900s in Utah, where, believe me, even today, going to Utah is like going on a foreign mission field. It really is. Uh, you cross that border, and it's just weird. Uh, many of those towns down, you know, Kanab and places like that in southern Utah are 98% Mormon. And um, it's, it's, I can't imagine what it was like back in, in the day. And the Mormon ladies back there had a much more sensible explanation of why we don't remember our spiritual childhood in the, in the pre-existence. Because you see, spiritual babies are born about the size of the little baby coming in right now. And we've had some other little babies uh, with us, and they make little noises and stuff like that. And, but the problem is, even that little baby is much bigger than the, when the baby was born already, right? And when you're born as a spirit child, you're born little, and you grow. And because remember, you're made out of matter. So you have little spiritual baby diapers and uh, little spiritual baby bottles. And, uh, you know, you have little spiritual baby hair that eventually grows uh, out. And, and little baby spiritual fingernails that you have to trim and the whole nine yards. It's just like the physical existence. And so their theory was that, you know, you grow up, be a six foot tall spirit, spirit being. And, but then when you get crushed down into the size of an embryo, you lose your memory. Just that simple. That was, that was what the, uh, the Mormon ladies came up with it, and if I were you, I would not argue with the Mormon ladies about this particular subject. Okay? So, spiritual preexistence. Let's go back to the big one here. Now let's go down to where the, the, uh, the square is. 
and blow that up. From the mortal, uh, from the spirit uh, realm, we enter into mortal probation. That's where we are right now. That's life on a planet. And this is where we are being tested. That's why it's called probation. And there are two ways out of here. There is one arrow that goes up to paradise. And there is one arrow that goes down to spirit prison. Now, the arrow that goes upward to paradise is, of course, the Mormon arrow. It is for the members, the faithful members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And what you have here uh, is a little A and a B next to it. And let me go back so you can see what the A and the B are. You can see down there at the bottom, A is faith, repentance, baptism, laying on of hands, and B is continued obedience to gospel rules and principles. So the A represents what's called the four fundamentals of the gospel. The four fundamentals of the gospel. Absolutely minimally, to get into celestial glory, you have to have the four fundamentals of the gospel. Faith, repentance, baptism, and laying out of hands. Now, uh, the problem here is uh, that what they mean by these words and what we mean by these words, again, have sometimes subtle, sometimes major differences. I don't have the time to go into all the differences in regards to faith and repentance, but there are differences in light of the fact that they don't believe that uh, Adam, for example, fell. They believe he fell upward. That he was placed in the garden specifically to fall and that he did exactly what God the Father and he had decided was going to happen when he ate of the tree. He was given two contradictory commands. One was to be fruitful and multiply. The other was not to eat of the tree. Since Eve had already fallen, the only way he could be, he could be fruitful and multiply was to eat himself. So he did the right thing in partaking of the fruit. So Mormonism does not have much of a doctrine of sin on that level. They certainly have a doctrine of sin. They have a do the very strong concept of worthiness and, and moral laws. But their understanding of things like original sin and depravity, completely unbiblical. Um, and so faith and repentance are a little bit different than we would understand them. Baptism has to be done by someone minimally holding the Aaronic priesthood. And the Aaronic priesthood, which was allegedly restored to the earth in 1829 by John the Baptist, uh, was given only to Joseph Smith and is possessed only by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So, baptism by immersion must be done by someone holding the Aaronic priesthood. And then laying on of hands to receive the Holy Ghost is to be done by someone holding the Melchizedek priesthood, which was restored to earth by Peter, James, and John, and also given to Joseph Smith and only found in the LDS Church. So, baptism and laying on of hands only the LDS version thereof, uh, is, uh, is acceptable. Okay? Those are the four fundamentals. Then the B was continued obedience to gospel rules and principles, uh, which in essence we would identify with generally as a works salvation or works righteousness concept. There is a strong push for Mormons to be worthy uh, of entering into the temple, for example, to even enter into the Mormon temple. Uh, to receive your priesthoods if you're a male, if you're to, if you're to uh, be married in the eternal marriage ceremony, if you're to go through the endowment ceremony for somebody else, etc., etc. You have to go through a temple recommend interview with your bishop uh, to see if you're worthy, if you're living the rules of the church. To some point, uh, there are many bishops in the LDS church who require you to bring your tax forms with you to make sure that you are tithing on the gross and not the net. Uh, that's how very stringent these, uh, these interviews can be. Uh, so that's the A and the B. Now, even with that, uh, there are only 14 million Mormons in the world. And so there are 6 billion people in the world. And so that's a small percentage, a very small percentage. And Mormons don't even believe that all Mormons are going to go straight up to paradise. Uh, there are many Mormons who are simply going to be unworthy of, of any and all of that. But even if all 14 million went, that's still a small percentage in comparison. So the vast majority of folks go down from the mortal probation uh, into the spirit prison. And uh, 
we, we've got to give uh, the Mormons some credit. Uh, they are a missionary people. They do a lot of missions work. They really, really do. And in fact, they are so missions-minded that they don't get to stop going on missions even when they die. Because worthy Mormons will come down from paradise to the spirit prison and proclaim the Mormon gospel uh, in the spirit prison. And I've never really figured out how it is that you could do that and not be very, very successful. If I'm in a prison and somebody comes and says, this is how you get out of the prison, and they can come and go as they wish, um, why would I not do what they said? But from the Mormon perspective, a lot of people still won't. A lot of people still won't. Uh, but there are some who do, and hence the line that goes from spirit prison up to baptism for the dead. Because, remember, what are the four fundamentals of the gospel? Faith, repentance, baptism, and laying on of hands by someone with the proper authority. Well, here's the problem. Um, a spirit can have faith, and a spirit can repent, but it's very tricky to baptize a spirit by immersion in water. Ever tried it? It's very hard. You know, you just keep pushing down and nothing happens. And it's just, and laying on of hands on the head, you know, whoop, oh, oh, no, no, whoop, oh, 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 oh. Doesn't, doesn't work. So uh, that's what baptism for the dead is for. Now, uh, you, have a, you have a temple here, don't you? Where is the Hawaii temple at? Okay, where is that from here? Okay, once again, it was a word with one L and a bunch of vowels. So really helps me a lot, you know. Is it, is it on this island? Okay, so it's on this island. Uh, anybody, did anybody here happen to tour it before it opened? Because they normally have an open house. You can tour it. You didn't get a chance to do that? That's a shame. It's very interesting to do. I finally got a chance to do that in the opening of the uh, Brooklyn te Manhattan Temple. Manhattan Temple. Um, but... Uh, so you have a temple here. The temple is very different from the ward chapels or stake centers you might see in your neighborhoods. Uh, only worthy Mormons are allowed into the temple once it has been dedicated. And if you were to go over to, did you say La Ea? La Ea. La Ea, La Ea. Oh, man. I thought Arabic was bad. Uh, Abdullah ibn Masud. Say that three times fast. Ha! See? I'm starting to feel dumb because I can't say these Hawaiian words. But anyways, if you went over to that place that starts with an L, and um, <laughs> on a weeknight, other than Monday night, and you were to just park outside and watch, you would see people coming in. They'd be carrying these, these little bags with them. And they're going in either to be baptized to the dead or to go through the endowment ceremony for the dead. Or maybe for themselves, but generally they're doing it for the dead. And what they'll do is they will uh, have done their genealogy work. If you've, if you've ever looked up your own genealogy, if you've gone on Ancestry.com or something, it's Mormon. The Mormons bought everybody else's genealogical libraries a long time ago. If you want to know anything about your ancestors, you've got to go to the Mormons. It's just, it's just the way it is. Um, and so they've done their genealogy work, and, and they will come in with as many as 50 names, it's all, all done electronically now. It's all done digitally now. It used to be you had them all written out and, and stuff, but now it's all done electronically. And these names are put into the system, and they're put on a card. You, you bring the card in. Now I remembered the graphic that I was going to, uh, I was going to grab and, and stick in here. Uh, let me make sure I can come back to this, because I, I thought I actually saved uh, this graphic, and I, I wanted to put it in here, but... Uh, I, I forgot to do so, but I can, I can grab it very, very, very quickly here. Uh, LDS, oops. LDS baptismal font. There it is. Now, that's a good shot right there. This is the one from the Washington Temple. And let me drag it over here for you. Oh, that is a little bit on the small side. What do you think? <laughs> That's because it didn't open up in the program. Here we go. Uh, it's still a little bit small, but it'll work. All right. Um, there's the uh, baptismal font in the Washington Temple. 
And you will notice that it is built on the back of 12 oxen. So that it is, if you remember your Old Testament, the, there was a laver in Solomon's temple that was built on the back of 12 oxen. And up until the Atlanta temple, every baptismal font in the LDS temples was below ground level. After that, they changed that. And I did notice that in the Manhattan temple, where they had to build a temple into a pre-existing building, which is very unusual. There's only other one temple like that uh, in, uh, I think, Singapore. Um, the lowest level in the Manhattan temple was where the baptismal font was. So they always have that at the lowest level. And there you can see what a baptismal font. So you can see you come down into it. In the newer ones, there's a computer station in it. And they probably have installed one in this by now, but the Washington Temple was built a number of years ago. Um, and again, the card's put in. You have one elder who does the baptisms. The other elder is at the, at the screen reading off the names. So I baptize you in the name of blah, 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 who is dead. You come up. I baptize you in the name of blah, 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 who is dead. Up to 50 times in, in a session. And then you uh, leave here, and you'll see the, the, actually you can see the recorder Right there is the recorder's desk. There, right up there in that corner is where actually the computer uh, thing would be now. And then you go through the doors, and right nearby there will be these special uh, rooms uh, where the elders then will gather with you, and they will go through the same list of names again, and they will uh, say, for the reception of the Holy Ghost in the name of so and so who is dead, they lay their hands upon you, they lift their hands up, then they put their hands back upon you for the next person through the 50 names, uh, and then you go back to the changing room and you're done, and that is baptism for the dead. Now, what does all that have to do with this? Well, go back to the, uh, the screen that we're looking at here. Four fundamentals. By your doing those things, you are fulfilling the last two fundamentals by proxy for anyone who's in the spirit prison. So if this person in the spirit prison hears the gospel from the faithful Mormon missionaries that come down and proclaim it, they repent, they have faith, and then back on earth, you are baptized in their name, and you have hands laid upon your, your head for the reception of the Holy Spirit. Now you can get out of the spirit prison via baptism for the dead and go up to paradise. They can also, you can also, for your dead relatives, uh, go through the uh, endowment ceremony where you receive the priesthood authority for a man. And you can also go through the eternal marriage ceremony for the dead. So technically, theoretically, you could actually not be a Mormon and still make the highest level of glory. As long as, as, long as somebody is, uh, we have 45 minutes questions. As long as, we have, as long as you have someone who does that for you. So that's how that works, is baptism for the dead, okay? All right. If that clock is wrong, is it quarter till? Shane? Because I don't have my... I don't have my yeah, it's quarter till. Right right okay. All right. So uh, I'm just going to figure that's six... Actually, during the break, I just might fix it. Um, <laughs> oh, Shane's going to fix it. Oh, good. All right. Thank you, Shane. All right. We're going to take a 15-minute break and come back. And we've got another 45 minutes. And then we've got 45 minutes questions, too. So we will uh, press on. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be right back after these messages. He was a very ignorant man. He was not well-trained in anything, though he claimed much uh, wisdom as a prophet. And he read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it said there was a glory of the sun, a glory of the moon, and a glory of the stars. There is a celestial glory, and there is a terrestrial glory. And he looked at that, and he said, well, wait a minute. If you've got sun, moon, and stars, that's three levels of glory. And Paul only said celestial and terrestrial. So there must be another level of glory to match the stars. And so what he did is he took the first two letters of terrestrial and slapped them on the last letters of celestial and came up with a new world called telestial <laughs> that no one had ever seen before in their lives. But Mormons today believe in three levels of heavenly glory, the celestial, which is likened to the sun, the terrestrial, which is likened to the moon, and the telestial, which is likened to the stars, or to this earth. 
Um, and in fact, let me show you uh, a picture here. I, uh, again, put this together just for you folks last night. Uh, there is the Salt Lake City Temple. And anybody ever visited the Temple Square in Salt Lake City? Okay. Uh, you probably weren't looking really closely at the uh, stones on the temple, uh, unless you were taking a tour guided by me, <laughs> which I have done in the past. And uh, the Mormons do not like my guided tours of Temple Square a whole lot. <laughs> I tend to point things out that they don't tend to point out very much. And uh, I've done it before, and they know who I am. And so, you know, there's these guys in suits, and they've got their little curly things going up in the ear, and they're on this number, and there's over on this side, you know, and, and uh, they're following me around, and I'm, hi, how you doing? Hey, look up there. Anyway. Um, but if you look at the side of the, uh, of the temple, uh, along the top, where the first row is, you'll see the sunstones. And then the middle row, you have the moonstones, and the, and the moon is in different phases along the side. And on the bottom, you have what are called the earth stones, or the world stones. And these represent the three levels of glory, celestial, terrestrial, and telestial. And they're built right into the architecture of, uh, of the Salt Lake Temple there. So uh, we go back to right there. Celestial glory is the, uh, the highest level of glory, and it's likened unto the sun. And you'll notice the green line is marked resurrection, resurrection. So the line coming out of paradise into the celestial kingdom crosses the resurrection line. And so at that time, the faithful Mormon or the faithful person who's become a Mormon even after death uh, receives their physical body, but here again, the depth of Joseph Smith's ignorance is made manifest. Um, because Paul said in 1 Corinthians that flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of heaven, uh, Joseph Smith taught that the resurrection body has no blood. It's flesh and bone. So flesh and bone, no blood. Completely missing Paul's entire point, but that's what Joseph Smith did over and over again. And now there's an entire religion that thinks that that's how you should interpret the Bible. Which is why Mormonism has never produced a meaningful exegetical commentary of any book of the Bible, because it can't. It is so far removed from the biblical worldview and the biblical text itself. So, uh, the person is resurrected, the body of flesh and bone, no blood. Uh, and... If, that, if a Mormon man has been faithful in receiving the temple endowments, receiving his priesthood authority, being married in the temple to his wife's wife right now, but that's only a temporary thing. If you want to see a Mormon defend polygamy, you can go ahead and ask him about it. They do believe it's right there in section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants. It's just currently on hiatus. Uh, but, of course, a Mormon man can be sealed to many women after his death. Joseph Smith was sealed to at least 80 some odd women after his death. Um, these women will be your wives in the afterlife. Um, you bring forth your wife by the power of your priesthood. Uh, ladies, you have no priesthood, and therefore you are dependent upon your husband's priesthood for resurrection, which is a good reason to be obedient to him. Think about the worthiness issues there. Um, and you organize a planet. You don't create a planet. You organize a planet, and you start procreating. Remember, what was, the, what was one of the powers of God? The powers of, the powers of God are two, the priesthood and procreation. Priesthood and procreation. And so you begin having spirit children. You have natural, carnal relationships in a body of flesh and bone with your wives, and they become pregnant. And yet, for some reason, once you're resurrected, the children you have are spiritual. And I'm not sure what a spiritual pregnancy would be like. But the offspring are spiritual. But there's a gestation period, the whole nine yards. And the woman, ladies, if, if, if you're really thinking possibly about that Mormonism might be something you might want to look into, um, keep in mind that in essence, what you'd be choosing is an eternity of never seeing your toes again. It's okay to laugh. It's all right. 
I'm serious. The woman's role is to have offspring. That's what she does. I had a Mormon man, an intelligent Mormon man, look me right in the eye outside the south gate of the LDS temple and say to me that his God has, if I recall correctly, around 60 billion offspring. That's why Mormons have large families, because they believe it is their duty to provide as many physical bodies for their brothers and sisters who are in the spiritual pre-existence waiting to get a physical body. That's why you have large families. When I, um, when I started teaching a class on Mormonism at the large Southern Baptist Church that I was a member of at the time, uh, my wife and I uh, went, and I wish she was here for this because I'd like to see her face when I tell the story, but we went to Glendale Sixth Ward one, the first Sunday of the month just because I wanted to visit a Mormon church and see what it was like. And the first Sunday of the month is called Fasting and Testimony Sunday in Mormonism. And what you do is you, uh, time during the service, they say if anyone has a testimony that they'd like to give of the gospel, um, now's the time to do so. And the bishop sits down. And we're sitting there. And we're sitting there. And nobody's getting up. And I sort of look over at Kelly. And she looks over at me and goes, don't you <laughs> One of those wifely things. We'd only been married for like six months at this point. But even then, you know what the wifely thing is, you know. And uh, I didn't that month. <laughs> Instead, the, the, the plot was hatched. And the next month, she came back with me along with Mike and Linda Beliveau. The four of us were the founders of Alpha Navigo Industries. And one other person. So there are five of us. And I had memorized a bunch of verses about justification by faith. And so when they said it was open, I didn't just jump up immediately. I waited. Somebody else had gotten up and had given a little testimony. So I get up, and I go down, and right as I got up, somebody got up on the other side, and they beat me to the front. So I had to sit down next to the bishop. And I'm waiting, and I'm just sort of, <laughs> and the person gets done, so I get up. Now, in the Mormon church, they don't have even a crying room. I mean, and there are kids everywhere. So there's little urchins crawling around underneath the, uh, underneath the pews, and there's this, this low hum, roar going on all the time. It's just, just the way it is. So I get up, and I say, well, I, I thank you very much for this opportunity of uh, bearing testimony, uh, especially since I'm not a member of the LDS Church. Now, I kid you not, there were babies going... <laughs> I mean, kids with paper airplanes, <laughs> freezing in mid-motion. Mid I mean, all the babies just free. It was, it was freaky. Everything came to a sudden halt in this place. And no one's breathing. Everyone's turning blue. It's just the most, it, obviously, it never happened there before. And so I start talking, you know, I start down my list of verses about what it means to, to be justified by faith and you know, so on and so forth. I get through about four verses, and this thing comes over my shoulder and lands on the pulpit. And it's a folded up bulletin. This was so long ago that it was one of those, remember those blue mimeograph machines? You know, you know, we're going to come out in all blue and stuff like that. Younger people are going, oh, who? <laughs> uh, what? Uh, but some of you are going, I remember a mimeograph machine before the photocopier. Yeah, okay. And uh, on the back has been written, Brother White, our time is up. Now, I had been there a month before. I knew exactly how long this thing lasted. And it was nowhere near the end. I was just get, getting the bums rush here, okay? But, so I finished up, and I go sit down. Well, the line forms on the left. Every missionary in the congregation is in line, and they're all testifying right at me, you know? And then when that's done, as soon as the last note in the organ is played, the first counselor is right at the end of our row and says, the bishop would like to speak with you, okay? Make a long story short, the only reason I'm telling you all this story, other than it's a rather interesting story, is I had some conversations with Bishop Stanley Buell, and, and on the phone a little bit later I had a conversation with him. He said, by the way, uh, that was your wife with you? Yeah, how long have you been married? Uh, about six months. Is she pregnant? Um, no. Well, I hope you get to that soon. Because you're supposed to be having kids. That's what Mormons do. 
because you've got to have kids to bring the spirit babies into the world. They even want us to have kids because that's still spirit babies come in the room. They can, in the world, they can send their missionaries and get them converted too. So all of that is this whole push. I mean, Mormons don't like single Mormons. That's why they have dances and all the rest of that stuff. They want to get people hooked up uh, and start creating more Mormons. If you go through all of that, if you're sealed, married to your wife, etc., etc., when you die, you go to the highest level of the celestial kingdom. And here's where the language thing comes in again. Look at, see the resurrection here? The line coming from the spirit prison, we'll get to that one in a moment, going to the celestial kingdom, terrestrial kingdom, celestial kingdom, all cross that line. So does the line coming down from spirit prison. We'll explain all those in, in a few moments. That means all those people experience resurrection, but only the people in the highest level of the celestial kingdom are not damned. All the rest, those who go into terrestrial, celestial, they're all damned. What they mean by that is they are damned up. Their progression to the greatest they could be is stopped. Because at the resurrection, only those who go into the highest level of glory, their bodies, their resurrection bodies, have the power of procreation. Everybody else's body is altered so you can no longer have children. That's what damning is. All right? Another, we use the same word, means something completely different by it. Now, like I said, the Mormons don't like single Mormons. But there have been single Mormons, and there have been Mormons who weren't married in the temple. So what happens to them? What happens to the single Mormon? If you have not gone through the eternal marriage ceremony, when you are resurrected, you become an angel. So Noah became the angel Gabriel. I'm not sure how Noah didn't get the message. Maybe there wasn't a temple nearby. I don't know what the story was. But Joseph Smith taught that Noah became the angel Gabriel. By the way, Joseph Smith taught a number of interesting things. Um, he taught that there were inhabitants of the sun who are very tall and dressed like Quakers. And he also taught um, that the, um, the Garden of Eden uh, was in Missouri. And you in Hawaii are going, yeah, right. Um, and that Noah built the ark in North Carolina. And then during the flood, floated over to Mount Ararat. That's how it got moved over there. But it all started in the United States. Okay? Just so you have that background information. Now, uh, so you have different levels even in the celestial kingdom. But to reach the highest, you have to have gone through the eternal uh, eternal marriage ceremony. So let's look down at this lower section here. For some reason, people who do not accept the gospel in the spirit prison uh, come out of the spirit prison and they are judged and they're sent to either the terrestrial or the celestial levels of glory. Um, Joseph Smith said that if you could see the glory of the celestial level, which is the lowest level, if you could see the glory of that level, you would immediately commit suicide to get there. It's so glorious. So what must the terrestrial and the celestial be like? They must be just so much greater. Um, I have had many a Mormon tell me that I'm such a good moral person that I'm going to make it to the terrestrial level of glory. I'm not going to be down the celestial level of glory. Well, I didn't really find a whole lot overly comforting in that because I happen to know that in the celestial level of glory, you have your drug pushers and your pimps and your mass murderers and Adolf Hitler and Genghis Khan and a few other folks like that. So to say you're not going to be with them isn't all that much of a compliment, to be perfectly honest with you. But they meant it as a compliment. You know, I don't to kick my cats or my dogs or, or things like that and uh, so on and so forth. So uh, interestingly enough, though, once very early on in my time witnessing the Mormons, uh, my friend Mike Belvo and I had gone up to Salt Lake City and we were tracting outside the members' entrance of the, uh, of the temple. Actually, it was, the it was the members' exit as well. And so they'd come out, and they'd turn, and they'd see, like, Mike over there with tracks. And then they turn, and I'm over there with tracks. There's no place to go. And they're like, and they have to walk past us. And uh, so we'd be passing out tracks. And it was a warm day. It was in May of, I think, 1984, if I recall correctly. And uh, may have been 83. Um, and... Uh, 
I decided I need a drink. We hadn't brought a bo bottles of water or anything like that. So there was a Howard Johnson's o over across West Temple. So as I was crossing the street on North Temple and West Temple in Salt Lake City, there is this sort of curmudgeonly old Mormon guy with his bag, and he's walking along. And so I decide as I'm walking along to hand him a track. And he takes a track, and the Mormons have this genetic thing where they automatically flip it over to the back side to see who wrote it. And, well, it wasn't the Mormon church, I can guarantee you that. And he just looks at me and he goes, go to hell. And I looked at him and smiled and said, sir, according to your theology, I can't. <laughs> and he was so frustrated because he knew I was right. I mean, I had ruined his insult by using his own theology even. I mean, it was just like, oh, he just wanted to explode the poor little guy. It was terrible. But... The reason I say that is because, we already saw that. Uh, let's look back at the, the major graphic here. Let's tie up a few lines here. Um, there is a hell down there. It's nice and bright and easy to see. Made it sort of the color of fire. And there is a line that comes down. And you might wonder, well, why would there be a line? Because if Genghis Khan and Adolf Hitler are going to be in the celestial level of glory, who's left? Well, there's a little thin line. It comes down from between the A and the B there. It goes to spirit prison. Those are apostate Mormons. Those are Mormons who have received a testimony that the LDS church is true and yet have denied that testimony. So they were on their way up and now they've hung a U-turn and they go down in the spirit prison and they don't get a chance to go to the celestial or terrestrial kingdom. They go down to hell. So the only humans who end up in hell are apostate Mormons. But there's another little line out on the side there. You notice it comes from spirit children down and into hell, and it's marked Satan and the demons. And so Satan and the demons, according to Mormonism, in this world, what happened was the God of this world is a God named Elohim. Elohim is the Hebrew word for God or gods, depending on whether it's used with a singular verb or a plural verb. Elohim once lived on another planet. And he was a man like you and I, and he went through the eternal law of progression, and he was sealed to his wives for time and eternity, and he proved to be faithful, and when he died, he was resurrected, and he brought his wives, and he... Uh, lives on a planet that circles a star named Kolob, K-O-L-O-B. And he began having offspring, and the first of his offspring after his resurrection and exaltation was a being named Jehovah, who is Jesus. So Jehovah and Elohim are separate and distinct gods in Mormonism. Uh, another one of his first earliest offspring was a creature named Lucifer, when there were enough spirit children to begin the process of populating an earth and starting the process all over again, Jehovah presented to all of his offspring in a council Elohim's plan. Now, in essence, in Mormon thought, Jesus and God the Father are Arminians and Lucifer is a Calvinist. Not by word, but the point is that the Father's plan, represented by Jesus, was that everyone would be given their own free agency as to whether they would become gods or not. Lucifer come along, came along and said, I'll be the savior of this world, and I'll force everyone to become a god. So he would take away their free agency. A vote's taken. Uh, Lucifer loses, and he gets mad, and he goes out, and he convinces a third of God's spirit children to fight in rebellion against God. They lose, they're cast out of heaven, and they become Satan and the demons. Now, there is another group of, of people who didn't fight against God, but they did not fight as valiantly. And Brigham Young and others said they were not as intelligent in the pre-existence as those who fought valiantly. And they are born with a black skin. And until June 8th, 1978, blacks were not allowed to hold the priesthood in the Mormon church. And even when that was rescinded, June 8th, 1978, the theology was not changed. It was just simply rescinded as far as the results of it were concerned. 
so there is a long, in fact, uh, Brigham Young taught that uh, the day that the, uh, the priesthood was given to the blacks was the day the church went into apostasy. So that was June 8th, 1978, uh, if you believe he was a prophet. Anyway, um, so that's where the Satan and the demons come from. But did you notice something about the line? The line marked Satan and the demons does not cross the green resurrection line. And so there's actually somewhat of a consolation prize for being a former Mormon who's now an apostate. Because according to Mormon theology, the Mormon apostates who are in hell will rule and reign over Satan and the demons in hell because they got farther through the process than Satan and the demons did. They have their physical bodies, but Satan and the demons do not. Okay? So, how do we make application to all this? Well, I asked earlier, um, how many of you were Trekkies? And a couple of you uh, confessed to, to being Trekkies. How many of you, the younger folks won't remember this, but how many of you remember a 19, late 1970s vintage science fiction show called Battlestar Galactica? Remember Battlestar Galactica? Okay. Uh, not the new Battlestar Galactica that was on cable. That's different. But this was, this was fun stuff back in the 70s where uh, you didn't have CGI. And so you had actors in really funky looking robot suits who were called Cylons. Remember the Cylons? And they sort of walk along. They had these eyes, you know. And uh, they've, uh, they've been, they're wiping out the human race. And, and uh, uh, they've destroyed all but a few of the, the, the humans' battle stars, which are these, these uh, fighting spaceships, sort of look like the Enterprise, but upside down. And uh, uh, so they've, the, the, the humans are trying to find their home world and survive the Cylons, and sounds like just fun science fiction. But if you remember it at all, you remember that the humans were led by, remember who they were led by? Yeah, Lauren Green, I know, but uh, he sold Alpo. Adama, Adama. And Adama ruled over the Council of the Twelve. And Adama and the Council of the Twelve, Adama had a, had a son. His first born son's called Apollo. He was a dashing young actor, you know. And uh, once Apollo and his sidekick Starbuck, which obviously was back before they could have been sued for using that name, um, <laughs> Apollo and Starbuck uh, and some others are captured by these glowing creatures. And these creatures say to them, as we are, uh, as you are, we once were, and as we are, you may become. And I remember my uncle Don was watching this TV show. And I thought my Uncle Don had lost his mind because he began quoting scripture verses to the television set. <laughs> Before me there is no God formed and there shall be none after me. And I'm like, oh boy, he's lost it, oh brother. <laughs> but my Uncle Don was smarter than me. Uh, the, the humans were looking for their home world. Remember what their home world was called? Anybody remember? It was Cobol. K-O-B-O-L. And the fifth president of the LDS church said, as man is, God once was. And as God is, man may become. Every one of the original authors of Battlestar Galactica were returned LDS missionaries. Every one of them. Didn't know that, did you? I look back at it now. I bought it all on iTunes. And it's just Everywhere, the marriage ceremonies, everything straight out of Mormonism. And we, don't, we didn't even, you know, my, 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 I don't think my Uncle Don knew Mormonism well enough to know that, but he caught something. He said, there's something wrong here. He sensed something. And uh, it, it was fascinating. So the, the LDS idea is that God the Father lives on a planet, circles a star named Kolob. This is in the book of Abraham in the LDS scriptures. Um, his firstborn spirit child is Jesus. Jesus is not virgin born. They will say that Mary was a virgin 
at the time of conception, not birth. But the consistent teaching of the LDS Church has been that God the Father in a physical body begat the body of Jesus with Mary. Now, given that Mary is one of his spirit daughters, that causes issues. But that's why Jesus had the ability to take his life back because he had an immortal father. And I'll never forget, I was staying at the West Temple of, in Salt Lake City, West Gate. Uh, Temple Square has three gates that were open back then. Now they've put a sort of southeast gate you can go in and out, but the actual east gate is welded shut because only Jesus is going to open that when he returns. But anyway, you had, a, had a nor the north gate, south gate, and the west gate. I happened to be at the west gate at that particular point in time. And people would come across the road. And I had learned from a friend of mine named Wally Tope, who, by the way, was the last person to die in the L.A. riots uh, years and years ago. He was beaten into a coma, died 18 months later. Um, he had rather unwisely decided to go out and pass out tracks to the people who were looting stores. And that, anyway, uh, he had taught me how to pass out tracks. And so I knew that you didn't just stand there and go like this. That doesn't get much done. You needed to walk with somebody, have a line or something like that. So this guy's coming across, and so I, I, I step out to meet him, and then I'm moving backwards with him toward the gate, so he, he has time to see the track, I have time to say something to him. He takes the track, and you can sort of see his shoulders go down. He stops, he's literally standing in the gate. He looks at it, he turns around, he looks at me, and he says, you know what's wrong with you? Now I've had that one a few times. <laughs> There's been a long list of things that came after this, so I'm just sort of staying there waiting. He says, you know what's wrong with you? You think sex is dirty. Now that one I had not heard before. <laughs> okay, that one was le I was left going, there are a few times I'm left without words. I was left without words. I'm like, eh? <laughs> he says, you think sex is dirty. You don't think God the Father could have had sex with the Virgin Mary to create the body of Jesus, and that's why you're wrong, and this is the true church. Goodbye, hands it back to me. Right, and he goes, and I'm going, wow. <laughs> I'm glad he admit. I mean, I knew what the doctrine was. And the consistent teaching of the LDS Church is that God the Father was, for at least a moment, legally married to one of his own daughters to create the body of Jesus. Now, they'll say they believe in the virgin birth because Mary was a virgin at the time of the conception. That's not a miracle. It happens. The miracle of virgin birth is the miracle that she was a virgin at the time of the birth, for crying out loud. Uh, but there again, and I've met some Mormons who just hate that. And in fact, some of the BYU professors mocked me for that once when we were on the radio station um, as being an 18th century speculation. I put an entire chapter in my book, Is the Mormon My Brother, documenting from beginning to end the consistent teaching of the general authorities of the LDS Church, uh, right up to the time when those guys were around. Uh, demonstrating that I was accurately representing Mormonism and they were engaging in a little bit of uh, deception and chicanery. Um, but Jesus is one God amongst many gods. In fact, I've had Mormons say that they believe that during the millennium, Jesus could get to marry and have kids and then he gets his own planet because he had to be the savior figure of this world so he didn't get a chance to go through the temple and do all the rest of that stuff. And he'll get a chance to do that and then he'll get to organize his own planet and he'll be the God, the father of that planet. Um, and so that's how it works out. You and I are spirit brothers and sisters. We have the same God, the Father, but we have different mothers. Mormons will frequently talk about how there will be like two Mormon women that will be really, really close to one another, and they'll say, I'll bet we had the same spiritual mother. And in fact, if we went to the local uh, uh, LDS church around here, I'd be able to pull out the LDS hymnal and find the hymn for you that talks about your heavenly mother. Uh, it's right there in their, in their music. And so uh, you and I pre-existed. We now are here to be tested. And if we prove faithful, then we return back in the presence of the heavenly father. We can organize our own planet. We start the process all over again, except now you are God the father to your planet and your offspring will worship you. And then they become gods and then their children become gods and and so on and so forth, and that's how it keeps happening over and over and over again. Okay? Now, with that said, um, one, many verses come to mind, but one in particular that I think is very relevant 
Isaiah 29, 16, you turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, he did not make me? Can the pot say of the potter, he knows nothing? That's Mormonism. It's turned everything upside down to where God is an exalted man. We have no creator. We ourselves are not created. Um, and I think that's an excellent description of, of what you have. Now, how do we share with Latter-day Saints? I'll have 10 points, and uh, then we'll uh, start taking questions, because I imagine you probably have a few. The first point is to be patient. And the reason I emphasize that is that leaving Mormonism is not like being a Methodist and becoming a Lutheran. It is a long process, especially people who are in Utah and places like that. It can be very much influenced by culture. Um, I was talking with uh, one of the pastors here, and he had mentioned uh, hearing numbers about uh, the conversion rates. Back in the 70s, 70s and 80s, for every one Mormon who left the Mormon church and became a Baptist, 27 Baptists became Mormons. So it was 27 to 1. During that same time period, uh, the average Southern Baptist church had 273 members, and in an average week, 274 Southern Baptists became Mormons. So that's one church wholesale per week. Those numbers are not as big as they used to be. Mormonism's growth rate is pretty much flat right now. In other words, it's natural growth. They have a lot of kids, so you get a lot of baptisms. Um, they're still growing, but not by the leaps and bounds that they once were. And part of this is because Mormonism has somewhat lost its way. It's lost its, its direction. Uh, we can discuss some of that a little bit later on. Anyway, it takes patience. You, you know, we used to go up to the General Conference of the Mormon Church every six months. First weekend in April, first weekend in October. And we would pass out tracts and witness to people all day Saturday there. Back when we were young, we actually drove up Friday night, passed out tracts all day Saturday, and drove back. Then we got old, and that became dangerous. Uh, <laughs> we need this thing called sleep now. And, um, you know, falling asleep driving through southern Utah is not a, not a good thing during the, some, some of the canyons down there. We would still be doing that. I would still be doing that to this day. The Mormons tried to stop us. They couldn't. You know who stopped us? Independent fundamentalist King James Only Baptist. They started showing up about 2003, street preachers. I call them street screechers. Because they showed up, they're poorly dressed, their signs are insulting or just dumb, uh, have almost nothing to do with Mormonism. And they stand there, and these Mormons are in long lines going into their meeting house, and they're very nicely dressed. And they're standing there yelling, it shouldn't be Mormon, it should be moron. And they think that's preaching. And of course, they poison the atmosphere, and the Mormons aren't going to differentiate between us and them. And so it just, it just destroyed it. We haven't been there since. Um, they started doing the same thing in Mesa, because for, for, since 1984, we had been passing out tracts at every single meeting in the Mesa Easter pageant. And that two, 150 to 250,000 people attend that uh, each year. Um, but then they showed up out there, people were getting arrested the whole nine yards. Uh, they, they managed to destroy all of it. So anyways, we'd still be doing that if it weren't for uh, those particular uh, individuals. We started a process in people's lives. I, I remember uh, a number of years ago, we got a phone message at Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church. And it was a woman in Logan, Utah. And she was calling and she said, a decade ago, my husband attended general conference and someone gave him a blue book called God's Sovereign Grace. I have read that book. I believe what that book says, but I can't find anybody else who does. Could you please help me? I don't know how that happened. My little book on God's sovereign grace is my defense of Reformed theology. I don't even know why I would have had one in Salt Lake City. Evidently, I had one in one of my bags. I had given out all my letters to a Mormon elder or something. Uh, the book I, one of the couple of books I've written on Mormonism. And, Maybe the conversation turned that way. I don't know. I don't know how it happened. But I passed out a copy of this book. And here is this guy's wife, 10 years later, calling and saying, I've read this book, but I can't find anyone who believes this. So thankfully, we were doing uh, There's stuff falling out of the heavens again. <laughs> what is this? What is this? Um, man. Uh, thankfully, I've been doing debates up in Salt Lake City with uh, the folks who were arranging them were from the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in, uh, in Salt Lake. And so I called them up 
And they actually started sending someone. Logan is not a suburb of Salt Lake. They began sending someone all the way out to Logan to get this woman and to drive her in for services. And the result of that was the, eventually the founding of a church in Logan and the conversion of the rest of her family. And now there's a church in Logan, Utah. Ten years, a book distributed doing outreach in Salt Lake City. Um, people have the idea that evangelism is you hand somebody the four spiritual laws and boom, they're going to get saved right there. If you think that works with Mormons, you know, the four spiritual laws isn't even designed to communicate with them. It's like shooting a 22 at a tank. It just bounces off. They, it doesn't overcome the language barrier in any way, shape, or form. And so you've got to be patient. You've got to be aware of the language barrier. Uh, and you've got to be sensitive to the individual's experience and beliefs. The witnesses present a very narrow spectrum of belief. There's no question about that. But Mormons are much wider, and especially because of BYU. BYU is one of the primary influences, believe it or not, in liberalizing Mormonism today. Because they have so much interaction with other viewpoints and traditions. They're having a major impact. And so, for example, back when I first started studying Mormonism, I could argue with little kids, and they would know what they believed. Now I can talk to Mormons, and they're clueless. I mean, they've gone from 3 million to 14 million during that time period. They didn't do a really good job in educating the people as those numbers increased. And so Mormonism is changing, and there's going to be a wider variety of, of, of perspectives. Back in the old day, Mormon Doctrine by Bruce Hummer Conkey. Oh, everybody read that and respected that. Now you've got, I'll find Mormons who disrespect it. So there is, you, you do need to hear what they're saying and find out if they're really coming from that perspective. Focus upon the central truths of faith. There is only one God who can save. Jesus Christ is our creator, the all-sufficient Savior. And salvation is God's gracious gift. Who God is, what salvation is, uh, who Christ is, and what salvation is. Those are your, your goals, where you're trying to get. And once again, just as with the Jehovah's Witnesses, if you don't have a goal, when you start the conversation, you ain't going to get to it. <laughs> um, you need to have an idea of where you're going and, and how you're going to get there. And... Therefore, when other subjects come up during the conversation, you can look at them as just being mere uh, off-ramps, and you're always trying to get back on. Once you get off, okay, I have to deal with Joseph Smith, Book of Mormon, but I'm going to find a way to get back on and get to my ultimate goal. Don't argue about polygamy with Mormons. It's not going to get you anywhere. It's a dead-end street. And as I said before, if you are going to say anything about Joseph Smith, being a false prophet, be ready to back it up. I mean, put yourself in their position. If, if, if you're sitting at, uh, what's the name of the mall? Ana Moana, <laughs> whatever it is, okay. That was close. Uh, you're sitting in the food court, and you've got your Bible out. And some guy walks up to you and says, is that a Bible? Yeah. You a Christian? Yeah. Well, you're in a cult. Really? Ever read the Bible? No. My brother-in-law showed me a video once. Now, how much credibility does that person have in your mind right now? None. Zero. Nada. We walk up to the Mormon. Oh, you're a Mormon? You're in a cult. Ever read the Book of Mormon? No, but I saw a movie at church about you once. How much credibility do we have in their eyes? None. And yet that's what we do, isn't it? So if you're going to say something, about Joseph Smith being a false prophet, then be ready to say, well, for example, in section 114, he prophesied that David W. Whitmer, and in company with 11 other people, including himself, was going to go on a mission the next spring. David W. Whitmer died that, that October. The other 11 people didn't die, uh, and so it's a false prophecy, and here's the reference to the documentary history of the church. But most people haven't done that reading and can't do that. So if you're going to, make sure you've got the material there. Make sure you can back up what you're saying or your credibility will be, will be shot. So stay on, stay on the important central uh, truths of faith. If I never had to talk about Joseph Smith again, I, my life would be complete. But sometimes I have to address the first vision of Joseph Smith or the, the frauds of the Book of Mormon or false prophecies or contradictions in the Doctrine and Covenants or the wild zaniness of the Book of Abraham. Oh, wow, that is the weirdest element of the LDS scriptures, is the book of Abraham, 
which Joseph Smith claimed he translated from Egyptian papyri found in a mummy. Well, that was great because at the time Joseph Smith claimed that, only about three people on the planet could read Egyptian. Um, then Joseph Smith died and the papyri disappeared until about 1965 and then they found him. And guess what? We can read Egyptian now. And <laughs> Joseph Smith never got a word right. I mean, he, he took, he took the, the word for moon and translated it into like 76 English words. Uh, I mean, he just never, he did, well, he did take the definite article, the, and the was in his translation amongst about 46 other words. But, uh, you know, I suppose we should give him credit for that. But, uh, I mean, there's just so much stuff. You can deal with that kind of stuff, but you've got to have the background. You've got to have the documentation. You have to have it either on your iPad, your iPhone, your Droid, whatever, to show people. I used to carry, along, I used to carry around a, a notebook that was this thick, just filled with photocopies. We called the Mormon Missionary Masher. And, uh, I mean, it was just it had everything in it. Now you could put all that onto a jump drive, and, you know, it doesn't look nearly as impressive. It doesn't help you do curls and stuff like that, but <laughs> it's, uh, you, you could do that. Make sure that you can back up what you're saying. Uh, be prepared to share why you accept the Bible as the perfect authoritative word of God. Why? Because of the eighth article of faith of the Mormon Church, which says we accept the Bible to be the word of God as far as it is translated correctly. What does that mean to a Mormon? Depends on the Mormon you're talking to. I talked to a Mormon woman once outside uh, the Arby's that used to be at the corner near uh, the Mesa Temple. I went through a bunch of verses, Isaiah 43, 10, 44, 6, and 8, 45, 5, and 6, that talk about the fact there's only one true God. And she didn't say anything. And I said, well, what do you think? She said, they're all mistranslated. Really, do you read Hebrew? Nope. I read eight books that deal with it. Nope. Then how do you know they're mistranslated? Because they, they disagree with what the church teaches. Now, there's someone who, you know, you can see what their ultimate authority is. You'll find a whole range of infection amongst Mormons. I mean, the Book of Mormon says that many plain and precious truths have been removed from the Bible. And the Eighth Article of Faith says we accept the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. It doesn't put a, unless it's not translated correctly, it's considered to be perfect. It's only the Bible that, as far as it is translated correctly, is added in. So uh, the first people that I had to deal with attacking the sufficiency of the Bible were the Mormons, not, not atheists. Avoid side issues that lead to blind alleys, as I said, uh, polygamy, uh, things like that. If pre-existing belief in Joseph Smith and the other church stands in the way, make sure you can back up any statements you make when dealing with Smith and the church. I guess I already covered that. Don't get in over your head. Utilize support systems. Make sure the elders know what you're doing. If you're going off to witness to Mormons someplace or something uh, along those lines, don't jump on your white horse and try to save the world. Share positive, challenging Christian literature. Uh, don't just give them books against Mormonism. Uh, give them good books on the nature of God. Uh, I, I gave a, a Mormon in Salt Lake once uh, R.C. Sproul's book on the attributes of God. Found out later he used it in his ward chapel meetings. Uh, great, do it. Uh, I'm not sure how you can put the two together, but hey, uh, why not? And uh, number 10, live the Christian life not just in being kind and compassionate, but in living a holy, godly life, not because you have to, but because you love God and wish to bring him glory. In other words, the Book of Mormon says there are saved two churches, the church of the Lamb, the church of the devil. Uh, I'll let you guess which one is the church of the Lamb, and that leaves us with the church of the devil. And so you, if you live a Christian life, are a walking, talking contradiction uh, to the teachings of the LDS church. Uh, and so obviously there needs to be a consistency between what you say and what you do and how you live. Uh, and that certainly is what the Mormon needs to, uh, needs to encounter. They don't need to encounter the, uh, uh, the slam door or the insult or, or anything along those lines. Okay? Are we clear on there? All right. How about we do this? Um, we've taken a lot of breaks. Why don't we do uh, questions now and, and try to wrap things up?